gently close your eyes. Do deep breathing. We'll chant Om once together. Synchronize the chanting of Om with your exhalation. Breathe in. Sahana Babatu, Sahano Bhunatu, Sahaviriam Karavavahai, Tejas Vinavadi Tamas Tuma Vit Vishavahai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Gently open your eyes. We'll chant from verses 1 to 5 of chapter 3. Arjuna Uvacha Arjuna Uvacha Jayasi Chet Karmanaste Jayasi Chet Karmanaste Mata Buddhir Janardana Mata Buddhir Janardana Tatkim Karmani Gore Maam Tatkim Karmani Gore Maam Niyo Jayasi Keshava Niyo Jayasi Keshava Vyamishreneva vakyena Vyamishreneva vakyena Buddhim mohaya siva me Buddhim mohaya siva me Tadekam vadanishchitya Tadekam vadanishchitya Ye na shre yo ham apnu yam Ye na shre yo ham apnu yam Shri Bhagavan uvacha Shri Bhagavan uvacha Loke smind vividha nishtha Loke smind vividha nishtha Pura prokta maya nagha Pura prokta maya nagha Jnana yoga na sankhya naam Jnana yoga na sankhya naam Karma yoga na yogi naam Karma yoga na yogi naam Nakarmanamanarambhat Nakarmanamanarambhat Naishkarmyam purushoshnute Naishkarmyam purushoshnute 
न चन्यसनादेव सिद्धि समिगति नि कशि क्षणमपी नि कशि क्षणमपी जातुतिष्टकर्म कृत्तिष्टकर्म कृत्ते ह्यवश कर्म कार्यते ह्यवश कर्म सर्व प्रकृति जैर्गुण सर्व प्रकृति जैर्गुण हरिओम एंड अ वेरी गुड डे टू ऑल ऑफ यू सो लास्ट वीक आई वॉज एक्सप्लेनिंग टू यू अबाउट द थ्री स्टेजेस इन द रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन अ मास्टर एंड अ स्टूडेंट विच इज बीन so beautifully depicted in the bhagavad gita see many people what they do is uh, they criticize arjuna thinking he is at a very low level they say oh what does arjuna know he is in ignorance he is unable to face this they talk about arjuna as if arjuna is at a is is a nobody but that's not true see number 1 arjuna was a great achiever in the world and number 2 he also had the spiritual potential he was a great achiever in the world in the sense he was in his field you know he was a number one archer he was loved by everyone he had such a sweet nature that is how uh, they have described him in the mahabharata and he also had a tremendous spiritual potential it is just that he was so involved in the world that he failed to tap the inherent potential which he had in terms of uh, spiritual expansion actually arjuna was a reincarnation of the great sage nara nara narayana they both were such great sages both of them were um, amshas of lord vishnu ansh avatar we say amsh avatar means partial avatars see like lord krishna is a purna avatar avatar means the infinite descending in the finite form with full awareness we can say born enlightened people even the word enlightenment is is not so much suitable there it is directly the manifestation of the infinite now nara narayana were great uh, rishis they did tremendous tapas in badrika ashrama the himalayas now narayana was re, uh, uh, was reborn as krishna narayana was slightly at a higher stage even right from beginning even though both were um, um uh, partial avatars of lord vishnu 
but between nara and narayana narayana was um, more superior in terms of uh, spiritual growth i'm saying he was more advanced so they both sat and did tremendous meditation tremendous tapas and it is said that narayana reincarnated as krishna and nara reincarnated as arjuna because he had done so much of tapas in his previous birth right from young age arjuna had this quality of focus his ability to focus was tremendous even as a young boy when he was learning archery from his guru drona dronacharya was amazed at arjuna's single pointedness see if you see in terms of archery arjuna ashwatthama ashwatthama was dronacharya's son ashwatthama and then karna who was fighting in the uh, for, for the kaurava camp bhishma drona himself all these people were great archers equals we can say very difficult to um define who is number 1 who is number 2 in certain places they have said that karna is technically you know uh, his technique was more polished than arjuna all these have also been mentioned so these were all great stalwarts but of all these arjuna was considered the best the number 1 not merely based on the skill see supposing arjuna and drona were fighting let us say nobody can defeat each other even arjuna and karna karna cannot defeat arjuna arjuna cannot defeat karna so easily i am saying if all other parameters are equal same thing with bhishma ashwatthama but why was arjuna called the best because of his quality to focus intensely he never wanted to become the number one archer he was so passionate about the art of uh, 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 he was so passionate about mastering the art of archery see if you take karna he was also very skillful he was passionate about archery but at the same time he wanted name and fame every person was involved in some uh, area if you take drona he was such a great master in uh, in archery but he was extremely attached to his son ashwatthama ashwatthama was equal to arjuna actually in terms of archery but he was very attached to duryodhana because duryodhana fed his ego bhishma in spite of being uh, one of the best he got bound by his own vow which he took that i will protect the um, the kingdom at all costs so even when the king was unrighteous he thought he should protect him so he was unable to go to the next level which is uh, giving more value to righteousness which is what krishna uh, taught him uh, actually uh, when drona fell down in the battle field um you know on the ninth day uh, after that uh, you know for 6 months he was on the he was lying on the bed of arrows waiting for the right time to leave the body he had this bone of rich ichcha mrityu whenever he wanted he can leave the body see these were these were great stalwarts so he thought uh, a particular time would be more conducive for me to leave so before he left the body lord krishna you know uh, uh, taught him the higher signs at that time he said bishma it is fantastic that you took a vow 
and you kept to that promise. But when there was a clash between your vow and righteousness, you should have chosen righteousness. That is where you got stuck. The moment Bhishma understood that and released all those attachments, it is said that he attained moksha. He got enlightened. So these were all great stalwarts. But out of all these, if you take Arjuna, he was inherently very pure and he was extremely focused. From where did he get that focus? Drona himself was uh, amazed uh, seeing Arjuna's focus when he was young, you know, learning archery from him. He got that focus from his, the tapas which he had done in the previous birth as Nara. So it is not that the relationship between Arjuna and Krishna started at that birth. No, it was there in the previous births also. Arjuna and Krishna were eternally related. That is why in the 18th chapter, Sanjaya says, wherever there is Arjuna and wherever there is Krishna, there, there will be prosperity, there will be peace, everything, all the glories will come to, uh, the, uh, will come there, you know. So, what had happened here was that Arjuna being so focused and, uh, you know, very, very uh, pure person, he got into a temporary state of delusion. And the delusion was temporary. How do we know that? Because he got out of the delusion very fast. Once he received the higher message from Krishna, he got back the strength. So it is a wrong approach when people belittle Arjuna as if... Uh, he has no stuff and you know, see that is a form of an ego. When you say, oh, um, see uh, what Krishna, Krishna is at that level, whereas Arjuna is only at that level. When, when you say that, you are uh, in turn equating yourself to the level of Krishna. So you have to ask yourself, have I achieved even one-tenth of what Arjuna had, uh, had achieved in the world? There is a portion in the Mahabharata when he was in Agnana, uh, that is uh, when he was incognito, the 13th year. At that time, uh, uh, he, he took the form of a transgender. And uh, Uttara Kumara, the prince of that, uh, kingdom, he, uh, uh, when he came to know that it was Arjuna, he was stunned and he asks Arjuna, I want you to tell me all your names. He lists to Ut Uttara Kumara what are his names, which, which people had given him. He says, I am called Vijaya. Vijaya means always victorious. I am called Anaga because of the inherent purity. Like that many, many names I am called Mahabahu because the, uh, you know, I, I have broad shoulders. I am called Savyasachi because he had mastered archery in both the hands. He was as dexterous with his left hand as he was with his right hand. Like this, he goes on enumerating his names because Uttara Kumara asked him, So such was his greatness. But what you need to understand is even such a great soul, the great Nara who was reborn as Arjuna, who had achieved such great heights in terms of worldly success. Now, he is also subject to delusion. The mind is so deadly. So, never ever take your mind for granted. You know, last week I was explaining to you the three stages, no? from appreciation to 
devotion and from devotion to surrender that's how a student uh, starts relating to the master now why is surrender so important because the the ego is waiting to create a delusion and once the mind gets into the delusion it's very difficult to come out just as a great soul like arjuna himself is finding it so difficult to come out of the delusion so in the ancient wisdom they have placed a lot of value they've given a lot of value to the relationship uh, which a student and a guru has why is that even in the bhagavad gita the arjuna and krishna were friends and arjuna could have approached krishna as a friend and he could have just given him all the advice but he has not put it that way he slowly uh, explains how arjuna you know see mere friendship is not enough that is only at the worldly level but he has to rise up further and uh, progress in this relationship from uh, appreciating the master to developing bhakti devotion and from converting the bhakti into surrender only then he could receive this higher wisdom so why has so much of emphasis been faced uh, placed on this uh, relationship the reason is all other uh, relationships bind a student to the world bind a person to the world whereas the relationship with the guru starts with the world see if if you if you uh, if you take any other relationship it starts with the world and ends with the world whereas if you take the relationship with the guru it starts with the world you see the form of the guru and you start relating but then it takes you beyond the world it takes you to the infinite so every other relationship binds you whereas the relationship with the guru liberates you that is why these great masters say that without a guru the spiritual evolution is not possible in every other relationship your ego gets strengthened whereas in the relationship with the guru your ego gets pulverized that is why it is very difficult it is not so easy to surrender to a guru because the for that the ego needs to be knocked off and the ego does not like it they 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 say the relationship with the guru is sacred because of this reason the best of the relationships which a person may have in the world will still bind bind him all the relationships are based on ignorance whereas the relationship with the guru is meant to remove the ignorance that is why it is very important not to get attached to the personality of a guru if you get attached to the personality of a guru then again you are making it a worldly relationship that is not going to elevate you a true guru will not allow you to get attached to his personality and get stuck there if he finds the the student is getting attached to the personality which is quite natural the mind will uh, function that way he will use various uh, methods by which he he helps the student to go beyond uh, those attachments no doubt attachment to a guru will help to overcome all the other weaknesses but then this itself will become a weakness if you don't if, if you get stuck there so a true true master uh, will be very watchful 
he will encourage the students um, attachment. I am putting attachment in quotes here. Attachment only to the extent where it is helpful for him or her to overcome the other weaknesses. But the moment he finds that this itself is becoming a block, then he will start working on that. He will help the student to go beyond that weakness also. So as sadhaks, what do, what is the message which we get from this overall uh, guru-shishya relationship which is depicted not only in the Bhagavad Gita but in every scripture? You know, there are certain scriptures where uh, it's a conversation between Lord Shiva and Goddess Parvati. So Lord Shiva, in one scripture, Lord Shiva is a guru and Parvati becomes his disciple. There is another scripture where Parvati takes the role of the guru and Shiva becomes her disciple. Lord Muruga, who was Shiva's son, now when Shiva asked him what is the meaning of Om, he said, I cannot explain to you the meaning of Om, Pranava Mantra, as your son. I will have to take the position of a guru. So immediately Shiva went and sat under Lord Muruga to learn. See, these are all just um, uh, what we call as leelas, the displays or dramas enacted to give the message. Lord Shiva, Parvati, Vishnu, Lakshmi, Muruga, Vinayaka, all of them were direct manifestations of the infinite. But they always, uh, you know, they, they, the various Puranic uh, incidents actually give us certain messages. And one strong message which they all try and give is that if you want to gain this higher wisdom, you will have to uh, become an eternal student. The more of uh, a stu uh, the more uh, you develop, you know, the, the qualities of a student, the more you will be able to absorb the higher energy. So, as long as Arjuna related to Krishna as a mere friend, it was a worldly relationship. He didn't get the higher wisdom. But the day the or the moment he started relating to him as a student, and progressed from admiration to bhakti, devotion, and from devotion to surrender, he started gaining the higher wisdom. So, mere physical closeness to a guru is no guarantee that a person can gain the wisdom. It is the inner connection, the spiritual connection which matters. So, where does this uh, principle of surrender come in? That is what we are seeing in the first two verses of chapter 3. Now, why is surrender so important? See, in order to gain knowledge, you don't require surrender. You can get knowledge. Knowledge means information, I mean, mere knowledge. You can get it even from a book. But the moment you want to learn the subtleties of the knowledge, then you need to surrender. If you want to learn the practical application of this knowledge, then again you need to surrender. The reason is, um, you know, the practical app application varies from situation to situation and you need to be completely tuned in to the master's frequency to grasp that. The third thing is when the student requires personal advice, again he needs to surrender. Why? Because when a master starts giving personal advice, if there is no surrender from the student, he may think the master is criticizing him. See, when is it that a student approaches a master for personal advice? When there is an issue which he is facing, it could be a weakness 
it could be some habit which he wants to overcome whatever it is whatever block he is facing he wants to overcome that then he goes to the master for personal advice so naturally the master may sometimes use harsh methods to break those blocks if so if there is no surrender the ego will get hurt the student may misunderstand and think that the master is criticizing him or her personally but actually a true master does not have any personal motives no axe to grind whatsoever is only focuses how um, how can this person benefit maximum uh, how can this person go to the next level as fast as possible for that he he will do anything even if he is mistaken in that process a master uh, is not bothered he will push the student up provided the student surrenders so for personal advice again the surrender is required and then not to talk about the higher energy to receive the higher shakti to get empowered again the surrender is the key mere bhakti devotion is not enough and that is why in the uh, bhagavad gita he deals with this principle exhaustively along with uh, uh, with the various uh, princ- uh, various principles of the ancient wisdom he he covers this in a story form how arjuna sir uh, starts the process of surrender and then he goes on building it so it is not enough if we just merely get the individual messages from the verse we should also see how the conducive environment is built uh by uh, uh, you know by arjuna by turning himself into a better student verse by verse and as bhagwan datatreya said be an eternal student we all as followers of these great yogis we should just absorb that it is so enjoyable to be a, a student and keep on learning you know every time we uh, read these verses the verses speak so much to us and when we learn this principle here then after that we'll be able to practice it with respect to our entire life every experience of life will start teaching us something it is already teaching they see every experience is teaching us but we are not able to learn because of a strong ego there is no attunement to the guru shakti so on one side you have the scriptures emphasizing on the higher energy on the higher wisdom the various principles the applications of the principles on the other side they lay tremendous emphasis on surrendering to the guru shakti and when there is a combination of these two the the, uh, the higher energy and wisdom and the surrender that becomes a, a very strong force which can uplift the student to the greatest heights which can give the student the enlightenment which he is seeking so arjuna uvacha what did he ask so whenever the arjuna uvacha comes we we have to see the psychology behind it uh, how the the student is getting molded it is like uh, you know uh, initially arjuna was like a stone and krishna is a sculptor and slowly slowly he is getting chiseled he'll be chiseled and he'll be made into a beautiful statue you know a raw stone can be made into a beautiful statue by an expert sculptor similarly uh, a true master can make a student 
from uh, uh, you know uh, a guru and he he can chisel the student but the process of chiseling is not so enjoyable you know to hit no to chisel so the breaking of ego uh, in order to break this uh, the ego some harsh methods may may be adopted that will not be so enjoyable so then what is that which will impel the student to continue in the path it is nothing but the surrender so from appreciation to devotion and from devotion to surrender it is such a powerful sadhana every yogi every siddha every holy master always stressed on these principles because this alone can uplift the consciousness this alone can prepare you to receive the force of the higher shakti see even in chapter 2 when we did the verse um, 71 i think it was taken for 21 weeks now the energy was increased tremendously and i did caution i did put a word of caution see the energy is being increased so you have to be careful because uh, the once the energy is increased now you will come face to face with yourself all your negativities everything will um, will be shown to you for the sake of self purification so there if the student slips the surrender uh, is a little less then the uh, he or she will not be able to take it they would prefer to stop uh, the entire sadhana that possibility is there but always as a human being you have a choice every moment of your life you have a choice and if you choose to surrender you will become the infinite you will go in the path of the infinite that is the beauty so what is arjuna saying in this verse number 2 continuation of verse number 1 with intermixed statements as it were you are seemingly confusing my understanding that part we have already seen and then he says tell me decisively one thing by which i may obtain the best He says, "Tat ekam vada nishchitya." The word "vada" is very interesting. Vada means tell, verbally speaking. Now, what Arjuna is unable to understand is, a master does not restrict his communication only to verbal language. a master always communicates when krishna was silent in the first chapter he was communicating his silence was speaking everything every action every word or uh, you know um, uh, silence everything about a true master keeps communicating the higher wisdom the truth when a student attunes himself or herself to that frequency there is no question of asking a master to speak or not speak when it's required he himself will speak when it's not required he'll remain silent but the student should go on absorbing see this is a common mistake which again a, st- uh, a student makes he thinks unless and until the master speaks and verbally says something he will he cannot gain the knowledge no actually what can be communicated with words is very less no probably 1% or 5% maximum what can be communicated beyond words is what is maximum 
Actually, the highest truth cannot be communicated through words. The subtleties of the sadhana cannot be communicated and fixed, you know, with uh, terminologies. Like what they do, the management, no? They have jargons and they fix, they try to fix uh, concepts using terminologies. That's not possible when it comes to uh, the sadhana, when it comes to the truth. So when a student is in the process of attuning, he is not yet fully attuned, he goes by the gross expressions of the master. And that is what um, Arjuna is doing here. He says, tell me, without understanding that Krishna's presence itself is a form of communication. See, just by being in the presence of Krishna, imagine if Lord Krishna were to be in front of you right now. Now, just being in his presence itself, you can learn everything, you can absorb everything, isn't it? Does he need to say anything specially? It is because we are not attuned that we require grosser and grosser expressions. So this is a, another sadhana as a sadhak to, to the, that is the sadhana of subtleizing yourself. You always look for gross expressions. People ask, now what is a proof of God? What proof do you require? The world is functioning. You see the solar system. You see, why solar system? You see your own body, your breathing. How is this mechanism happening? See, in science, we see the immediate mechanism. Ah, the inhalation, we are taking an oxy uh, oxygen, exhalation, we are exhaling carbon dioxide, all these things. But how is this process being maintained? What is the guarantee that when we exhale, we will be able to inhale again. Yet we have that faith, no? Without faith, we cannot continue in life. We will be afraid to exhale because we don't know whether we will get the next inhalation. But that faith, childlike faith, everyone has. So, just see, look at how the flowers are blooming. Look at people, how they are talking, how they are functioning. You know, every little aspect of this world itself becomes a proof of that supreme power. You call it God, you call it anything you want. These are all just names. But some power which is beyond all this. As you subtilize yourself through sadhana, you will no longer need gross expressions as proofs of divinity. You can just simply watch your own breath and you, you can get attuned to the infinite. You can just watch a rose bloom and you can get attuned to the infinite. Buddha kept on teaching this to his disciples. He said, you don't require too much in order to get enlightened. Just one experience is enough. If you learn to subtilize yourself and penetrate, he said, you can achieve and you can attain enlightenment. So when a student approaches a master, it is the same thing. Student is vibrating at a gross, lower frequency. So unless and until the master also gives a gross expression, he thinks the master is not communicating to him. But that is not the truth. 99.9% .9 of the communication happens non-verbally only. And as the student advances further and further, the communication happens only in silence. The empowerments will become very, very subtle. Why is it that in any empowerment, the master makes the student close the eyes and go deep into meditation? Because that is where 
these subtle truths can be experienced. So here Arjuna is saying, Tat e kam vada. Vada means speak. Unless you speak, I am unable to understand. So that shows that he is still vibrating at the gross level. So that is a sadhana tip which we can get as sadhaks. So you can absorb that. Start uh, making, uh, you know, uh, making yourself more and more subtle by doing your daily sadhana. When you are gross, you need an extraordinary expression. Only then you can recognize divinity. You have to go to the Himalayas, otherwise you, you cannot get connected. You have to do an elaborate ritual. Even after doing all that, I find that people's focus is not on God. They get involved in the uh, technical details of the rituals. But as you advance spiritually, you don't require so many expressions. They say, no, silence is the language of God. But in order to uh, in order to receive that communication, you have to subtleize yourself and become silent inside. I am covering this vada specifically and giving you the subtle principle because in the next verse it's going to be Shri Bhagavan Uvacha, the blessed Lord, the supreme Lord. He starts speaking. Now, if you are not attuned, if you are not subtle, you will only get attuned to the gross expressions, the words which he is giving. But before we go there, I am giving you the higher energy, the, the little bit increasing it, so that you become subtle enough to be able to absorb the deeper communication from a master. So, Sri Bhagavan, when we come to Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, we'll see that. It's not mere words. It's not mere knowledge. It's much, much more powerful than that. So, you need to subtleize yourself to be able to receive that. Why are we spending so much of time in verses 1 and 2? Arjuna Uvacha. Because we need to prepare ourselves. The more we prepare, the more we'll be able to receive the energy when we come to Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. So, Tat Ekam Vada Nishchitya. Vada is a very powerful uh, trigger that is a reminder to all the sadhaks that yes, I have to become more subtle. I have to tune myself. It's like the fine tuning, you know. And the more you tune yourself, the more you will get attuned to the higher. The more you purify yourself and become subtle, it's very easy to receive the higher grace, the higher Shakti. You know, it is said that every time you utter a mantra, the energy of that mantra is right before you. When you say Om Namo Narayanaya, that energy is there. Om Namah Shivaya, it is there. But you don't see that because the subtlety is not there. So the entire spiritual path moving from Nara to Narayana. Nara also means a human being. Narayana means that supreme power uh, within a human being. So uh, Arjuna and Krishna as Nara Narayana, that is also symbolic. So powerful, you know, that message. So the entire journey is moving from 
Nara to Narayana by subtilizing yourself. And the more subtle you become, every action which you do, every word which you speak will gather so much of power, momentum that will influence others in a very positive way. It will attract all the positivity into your life. So, you can make a note of that. When he says, Vada, that is the grossest expression of communication. But as Sadat, you need to tune in, subtilize yourself and start uh, moving uh, within. Start becoming very, very subtle. So, Tat Ekam Vada Nishchitya. Tell me decisively. So he feels Arjuna, uh, Krishna is uh, being indecisive. Why is he feeling that? Because, uh, see, Krishna is doing a lot of analysis because it is required. See, I have always said, wherever it is required, you need to analyze. Where it is not required, if you analyze, then uh, the, that will cause confusion. But where it's required, you need to analyze and then come to a proper conclusion. Wherever things can be understood directly, you need to understand them directly. Where you need to analyze the pros and cons a bit and then come to a conclusion, you need to use the faculty of your intellect to analyze. So what is the purpose of analysis? To come to a conclusion. For uh, to make uh, uh, to to uh, make an effective uh, decision, to take an effective decision. So Krishna is analyzing, but Arjuna is not used to analysis. See, Arjuna is a warrior. He is a soldier. Now, what is the motto of a soldier? Even today, if you go to the army. They, you know, the motto of a soldier is to do or die, not to question. This is what they say. So, Arjuna has been trained like that. Being a soldier, being a warrior, he was a man of action. So, to do or to die, not to question. But the problem is, spiritual evolution cannot take place if you don't question. See, on one hand, we are emphasizing so much of, on surrender. But on the other hand, we are also emphasizing so much on questioning. Questioning means not doubting the uh, master, no, not doubting the person. It is asking genuine clarifications to uh, overcome the blocks. That is very important. Later on, uh, Krishna will be giving out the uh, qualities of a student. He says, in one of the uh, one of the qualities is pari prashnena, questioning, questioning with a law. And then he also says pranipatena, pranipatena means surrendering. So they both have to go hand in hand. If surrender uh, is not backed with proper questioning then it will become blind faith, blind surrender. That is not uh, good. But if there, if there is only questioning and no surrender, then it will lead to arrogance, intellectual arrogance. That is also not conducive. It is a combination which is conducive. So, Krishna actually analyzes. See, even in chapter 3, even though Arjuna is asking, tell me decisively one thing. When we come to what Krishna says, he will start analyzing. Why? Because in sp uh, these spiritual principles cannot be uh, given at one go with just one word like that. Like what Arjuna is asking. It is not only true with spiritual principles. Any art or skill you want to master, you just can't have one point or one practice with, through, by which you can master the whole thing. Supposing, let's say, as a, you know, you want to learn cricket, 
a person wants to learn cricket he goes to the coach and uh, is a batsman now the coach will say when the ball is pitched up you take your leg forward and play a forward stroke when the ball is uh, a short pitched ball now you go back like this various and then if the ball is on the off side how you should keep your leg and play a cover so many strokes are there no similarly if the ball is on the leg side what how you should play that so everything one by one he'll explain and he'll make the uh, player master those skills but supposing the batsman becomes very um, uh, you know restless and he says see why are you telling me so many thing just give me one stroke by which i can master the science of this art of batting <laughs> now the coach will say that is not possible you pack up and leave how is that possible if you go if you want to learn music let's say classical music now basic swaras are seven then there are sharp notes it becomes 12 in hindustani music they even go up to 22 notes sometimes they mix the certain uh, notes and they give that now various you know in different systems different ways are there but the point is and then uh, different permutations and combinations of these notes create the ragas everything you one needs to learn you can't say just give me one note by which i can master the entire classical music so arjuna asking one thing by which i may obtain the shreya the best the highest is as absurd as a person saying just tell me one note by which i can master the whole of uh, uh, the whole classical music so in anything in life the principles are there and then the applications will vary so much so you need to be patient so in spirituality patience is a very important quality which a sadhak should develop that is the sa- uh, sadhana tip which we get from here you can make a note of that it's a practical tip see arjuna being a, a warrior a man of action he is getting restless so he is saying he is telling krishna now okay i don't want all this now just tell me one thing but krishna is not going to give in to that request of arjuna because if you know see arjuna just said tell me one thing but krishna gives an entire third chapter as explanation of karma yoga up a true master will come down to the level of the student to communicate but his aim is to pull the student to his level not to come down to the student's level and stay there so he is not going to tell arjuna any one thing actually arjuna is asking for one thing when we come to verse number 3 we'll see krishna gives a very roundabout answer and that's why after chapter 3 in chapter 4 again arjuna repeats the same question which is superior knowledge or action but uh, when we come there we'll see it's more refined it's more pointed which means arjuna's restlessness is uh, coming down you know verse by verse chapter by chapter so the spiritual path the spiritual journey is a lifetime journey you can't become impatient oh i have done sadhana for 6 months i have done sadhana for 1 year oh my oh, so many thoughts are coming of course thoughts will come you have accumulated those thoughts those impressions for millions of births just because you do a little bit of sadhana you should not become restless and uh, become result oriented uh, the the weakness which arjuna was having was uh, being result oriented because he was a man of action so l- learn this tip never ever become result oriented have a goal and then chalk out a program and then keep uh, 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 you know keep doing the right things that is the process enjoy the process and if you if you do the process in a perfect way 
automatically the goal will be achieved. But in between, the mind becomes very restless and impatient and it becomes result oriented. The moment you become result oriented, especially in spirituality, that becomes a very big block. It will not allow you to quieten down and do your sadhana effectively. It will make you very restless. See, once you sit inside the flight, the flight will take you to the destination. You can relax. Relax and be alert. You don't need to keep walking up and down inside the flight in a restless way. When am I going to reach? Will I reach? When I... All that is not required. That was Arjuna's state. That is why he's saying, tell me decisively one thing. Typical example of a soldier. So life is not so simple, it is complex, every situation will vary. We will have to see how this wisdom can be applied in every situation and it will all be so different, the applications. So Arjuna is confusing analysis with indecisiveness. See Arjuna being a man of action, he will first act, then he will not think at all, then only he will think. Like some people are like that, you know, once a person told me, I never think. I first act. Later on only I think he says. <laughs> and he, he, he felt so proud about it, you know. Then I had to very carefully tell him that that is a very dangerous way of functioning. You need to bring that balance. So Arjuna was like that. He was a man of action. So any form of analysis he feels is indecisiveness. Now, you need to learn to differentiate between indecisiveness and analysis. True analysis is aimed towards taking a, an effective decision. How to every decision which you, um, which you uh, take in life is going to decide the quality of your life. Should I do this or should I do that? Should I, uh, see, as soon as you finish your school schooling, now, what should you pursue? What subject should you pursue? Now, at every step, you have a decision. Should, if you get a job offer, should I take this or should I take, take up this? Should I marry this person or that person? Like this, you know. Life is full of these choices and you need to decide. Now, in the ancient wisdom, one of the aspects of the ancient wisdom is effective decision making. So, in many places, effective decision making can be achieved through the right analysis. But a restless mind will become impatient and it will confuse the right analysis with indecisiveness. That is what Arjuna is doing here. He feels Krishna is being indecisive. If only Arjuna can just um, uh, calm down a bit, and if he attunes to Krishna and goes along with Krishna's analysis, that will take him to a perfect decision. Which is what happens as the Bhagavad Gita progresses. Arjuna also quietens down. And he starts flowing with the in a flow set by Krishna. Rather than flowing in opposite direction and expecting Krishna to come to his frequency, he starts attuning to Krishna's frequency. And where did it lead to? Beautiful flow, he gained all the wisdom and finally he decided, all my delusion is gone, I will fight, I will do my duty. That is the effective decision. So in life, either you act very impulsively or you go on analyzing without coming to any conclusion. That is also wrong. So you should learn to take the middle path. Wherever you can absorb things directly, absorb and learn. Wherever you are not, you cannot le uh, learn things directly, use this tool of analysis, but remember only to come to a conclusion. It should not be an endless chain of analysis. That itself um, 
uh, you know, in the management jargon, they say, you know, analysis, uh, paralysis. They say that, no. So it shouldn't become that also. It is, you should be in the middle path. So Arjuna is, a, is, a, is at this extreme. He doesn't want to think. He doesn't want to analyze. He doesn't want to put in all that effort. He is willing to put an effort at the physical level, but not at the subtler level. So spiritual growth cannot be achieved that way. Spiritual, in a, see, if you want to grow spiritually, you should be prepared to put an effort physically, emotionally, intellectually at the pranic level and at the soul level. At all levels, different sadhanas. As you advance, you know, and gain different empowerments, you will become uh, equipped. So you need to be prepared to put an effort at all levels, not only at one level where you are comfortable with today. That is not enough. So, tell me decisively one thing by which I may obtain the best, he says. Shreyaha. Shreyaha means the best, whatever is good for me, the highest. So, the mind wants the best. But it is not prepared to put in the required effort. It's a beautiful depiction of another weakness of the mind. So you've got to look within and see how you are functioning in life. That is the sadhana tip, that is the homework which is being given to you. See, you want the best in life. But now the question is, what price are you willing to pay? Everything has a price in this world. Nothing comes for free. Please understand this. You will have to repay in some way or other. Why is it that seva, service, is uh, given as a part of uh, the karma yoga, as a part of one sadhana? Because we keep on taking in life, right from birth. As a great thinker said, service is the rent which we pay for occupying this uh, earth. Beautiful statement, you know. So nothing comes free of cost. The mind wants everything free. My, the uh, mind does not want to put any effort, does not want to pay a price. So as a yogi, as an aspiring yogi, if you want to grow spiritually from this moment onwards, don't look for free things in life. Always look at what you can contribute. What is the price which I am willing to pay in order to get something? We don't want to put in any effort, but we want all, everything. That is a tamasic attitude. Arjuna temporarily has gone into tamas. That is why uh, he says, I want the highest, but I am not willing to, uh, to gain this higher knowledge, analysis, all this I don't want. Just tell me one thing in a very simple way, but I want the highest. This is... Uh, uh, a major weakness which the human mind has. Who are the great achievers in life? Those who are willing to sacrifice the present enjoyments whenever there is a clash between the present enjoyments and the long-term goal. So those who sacrifice can become achievers. You see, in life, you take any achiever in any field, that person would have sacrificed so many small, small things. Today, you may see their, their achievement, you may see them in glory, and you may think, oh, why has God favored them alone? It is not like that. Every achiever has gone through a lot of struggles, 
would have made so many sacrifices. That is the price which they have paid in order to achieve that success. So when you write down your goals, always ask yourself, okay, this is my goal. Now, what is the price I am willing to pay in order to achieve this goal? If you are doing the Yoga Sankirtan Sadhana or if you are attending an empowerment thinking that Oh, I will just, I don't need to do anything But just through the higher grace Now I can, all the goals will be, man, uh, will, will uh, get fulfilled You are living in an illusion That is Tamas This higher sadhana is not meant to promote laziness. So first thing is fix goals in life. And then, you know, your, um, uh, ask yourself, what are the things which I need to do in order to achieve these goals? That is how you need to prepare a plan of action. A student who doesn't uh, study properly but simply prays to God and uh, expects a miracle to happen is uh, fooling himself or herself. So here Arjuna we can see wants to obtain the highest shreha. The motive is very nice. I am sure all of you will also want to achieve the highest Everyone, you go and ask anyone in, in the streets, what do you want? They will always want big, big things. But for that you need to do all this. There, they will succumb to the immediate pleasures. See, what does not allow you to achieve the, your long-term visions or long-term goals in life is, uh, are the immediate pleasures. See, as long as an immediate enjoyment is not clashing with your long-term goal, you can enjoy. But when there is a clash, you need to have that capacity, you need to build that capacity to sacrifice, to say no to the present enjoyment so that your long-term vision or goal can be fulfilled. That will make you an achiever. Spirituality, the spiritual growth, enlightenment is meant for strong people who have developed this capacity to sacrifice. Sacrifice doesn't mean self-torture. You see a person who is fired up with a higher goal, when he says no to these small, small things, that doesn't bother him. Even relatively, Supposing, let's say, say, uh, say a, a mother is there and her uh, child is there. Now somebody comes and gives one chocolate. Now the mother has so much of affection towards her child. Now she, let us say the mother likes chocolates very much. But even though she likes chocolates very much, she will forego that the, the, the pleasure of the chocolate and give it to the child. Because that seeing the child enjoy the chocolate gives her a higher ple a pleasure. That is what, uh, that is how a true mother will be. So here it is just uh, one step higher seeing the other person enjoy that. For that itself she gets so much of capacity to Sacrifice. So then imagine a sadhak who wants to realize God, the highest, who wants to become one with the infinite. Then how much he has to develop this power of sacrifice. It doesn't come uh, just by, you know, it doesn't come in a, uh, uh, in a single day. It comes through a lot of sadhana and tapas, this very capacity to sacrifice. Later on, Krishna will be explaining this in detail. 
he will be teaching a little bit about the science of materialization in karma yoga chapter when we come there we will see the deeper principles but as of now do this homework see you take up the your unfulfilled uh, unfulfilled goals in life things which you want to achieve but you never achieve them and then ask yourself did i pay the price for it did i do everything required in order, order to achieve that goal you will find the answer will be no many many things which uh, ought which should should have been done you would have skipped all of them that is why you couldn't achieve that goal so now revise see this is how you can create your destiny destiny is not predetermined by some other person no it is you who is crea- who is creating your destiny whatever your situation you are facing today in life is created by you only now if you want to change your life you need to pay the price for it karma yoga is the price which you pay for enriching your life at both from the worldly level and from the spiritual level every principle of karma yoga when it is given to you see unless and until you are prepared to put in that effort they will you know uh, you will not get the desired result of uh, spiritual evolution and also worldly success that combination you you will never be achieved so on one hand arjuna says i want to up- obtain the best shreya that is good always you should think high but if you stop uh, with that and if you don't put in the necessary efforts in order to achieve that then it just becomes a uh, high talk and uh, no uh, practical uh, effort so thinking the objective wise is is i want the best but effort wise just tell me one thing make it very simple and give me i don't want to uh, put on all this effort to understand the higher wisdom so so that i can achieve the highest so there is a contradiction in the energy flow there whenever you want something you create a particular energy flow but then you also create opposite uh um, you know you you encourage opposite emotions and thoughts which create uh, another energy flow in the opposite direction your entire life is one of contradictions one hand you want something in this direction on the other hand your mind is flowing in the opposite direction a yogi is one who unites all his energies and who becomes single pointed that is a price you need to pay so many people tell me i want to grow spiritual i was you know when people say i want time for, so can you give me some time i want uh, guidance and all that first thing i ask them is are you watching the sunday discourses some of them say no i say first watch put some effort Uh, are you doing the daily uh, yoga sankirtan sadhana so do that for a while and then when you uh, when you take guidance specific guidance you will be able to follow that so most uh, no, no, i wouldn't say most but so, so many people they don't want to go through all this they don't want to do any sadhana they don't have the patience to listen to these sunday sessions but they just uh, they they just feel i, I want to meet you sir and i want to take your blessing some miracle they want the greatest miracle in life is that power to put an effort which has been given to a human being that is the miracle using that you can achieve anything you want so don't stop your efforts and expect miracles that will never happen so tell me decisively one thing by which i may obtain the best so as uh, sadhaks we we have, we get so many sadhana messages from this sadhana tips so take them 
and uh, reflect on them and see how you can uh, apply them in your life that is very important the like for example i said no take some unfulfilled aspects of your life why are they unfulfilled again the mind will want to blame something or other but see what is the what are the things which ought to be done have i done them properly or am i doing them properly and if the answer is no then you can correct yourself you can see okay what are the aspects which i need to add on and do so that i achieve the desired goal so when when you function this way when you overcome your tamas and when you do your yoga sankirtan sadhana this higher energy will support you will speed up the process remember if you are tamasic this higher energy will not function that is how uh, this yoga sankirtan sadhana materials uh, they have been designed we have put a minimum and maximum energy limit if a person is tamasic the energy flow will not be there but when you put in all the effort required effort and then when you do the sadhana this energy will uh, you know it's a, it's an it's an infinite energy it will keep on protecting you and uh, it will help you uh, uh, overcome all the blocks which you may face in your journey one by one every block will be removed and your progress towards your goal will be speeded up tremendously whether it is a worldly goal or a spiritual goal you need to apply this principle that is you have to pay the price for anything never look for something free in life later on in the same third chapter he'll be expanding on that he will say one who does not contribute anything but simply keeps taking free such a person is a thief he says he gets stenaha stenaha means thief a very strong word krishna uses so that you know the, the impact is created and a person comes out of the tamas okay so we'll stop with that today uh, a lot of principles have been given very very useful principles for you uh, so spend some time and absorb them because when you absorb these principles as i told you you will become prepared for the blast of energy which will start from verse number 3 shri bhagavan uvacha it is very difficult to give a discourse on shri bhagavan uvacha because the moment you say shri bhagavan uvacha the mind goes off into the higher state speechless state you know the mind gets transfixed in the glory of the infinite yet we are going to unravel all the mysteries all the deeper messages so these principles which have been given to you in verses 1 uh, and 2 are the necessary preparation preparatory qualities go on developing these don't leave them to the extent you develop these qualities to that extent you can tune in to the higher wisdom to the higher messages okay so now we will uh, do the nididhyasana meditation sit in a relaxed way whatever principles were given to you they will be installed in the deeper layers of your mind through the process of nididhyasana so that after that it will make it easy for you to practice gently close your eyes do 
deep breathing Feel the divine vibrations. With every breath, I am going deeper and deeper into myself. I am not this body, I am not these various emotions, I am not these thoughts, I am that supreme infinite self From this moment onwards, I choose to be an eternal student, a perfect sadhak, My ultimate goal is to realize the infinite.
I am willing to pay the price in the form of regular sadhana in order to achieve my goal I bow down to the Guru Shakti I bow down and surrender to the infinite God principle I am Swayam Prakashit, Self-Illuminating. Offer your gratitude to God Supreme. Offer your gratitude to your Guru and all the Holy Masters. Slowly come back. Wriggle your fingers, your toes, rub your palms together to create a warmth. Cup your eyes with your palms.
gently rub your eyes cheeks forehead top of the head back of the head and neck slowly open your eyes Welcome back. So these two verses, verses one and two, have given us so many practical tips with which. we can go on fine tuning ourselves next week we'll be entering into verse number 3 and krishna is going to expound the sacred sadhana of karma yoga so the more you practice verses 1 and 2 the more you will be able to receive the higher energy when we go to verse number 3 the yogic approach we take time to absorb prepare ourselves before launching into the higher aspects that is very important okay so spend some time reflecting on these points and do your daily sadhana and come fresh next week come fully prepared to receive the higher grace of shri bhagwan uvacha Okay Thank you very much Hari Om